Hey guys, welcome to the HYM podcast, the podcast talking about all aspects of motorsport from four wheels to two wheels and everything in between. I'm your host, Nick Yellowly, factory BMW driver, and I'm joined by fellow Brummy and host Jake Hughes, Rocket Venturi Formula E reserve driver, also producer Alex Murley, ex world supersport rider. How are we doing? Yeah, pretty all good. good, boys. How are pretty you? Good. Yeah, all good, all good. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to today's episode. We have um, someone who first started his career in his native South Africa. Uh, where he became, uh, I think, champion in the Polo Cup out there. Um, and he's since moved into Europe in 2016, racing in the Audi TT Cup, uh, likes of Blanc Pan, ADAC GT Masters. Um, and his last two seasons, he's been a factory driver for BMW and DTM, where I think his most not- not- noticeable standout achievement was the youngest pole sitter in DTM. Um, so, yeah, pleased to welcome him. It's Mr. Sheld- Sheldon van der Linde. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, all good, boys. All good. Uh, thanks, first of all, for the invite. Um, I was actually watching Seb Morris's first episode a couple of weeks ago. Well, not a couple of weeks ago, but two days ago, and uh, it sounded really exciting. So I was definitely keen to join. Uh, the first thing I said to Nick on Twitter was that I'd be happy to join you guys uh, for this new kind of venture that you guys are on. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to have some fun and cool stories to tell for sure. What did you reckon to the first episode? I think it was cool. I think it was uh, especially the way that Seb kind of was super open about everything. I mean, it's definitely his personality to uh, not really hold <laughs> anything back from anyone. That's, that's just Seb, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I was actually on holiday with him last year in Cape Town after the Kailami Nine Hour that me and Nick did. Yeah. And uh, it was definitely a, a, an eventful couple of days. Uh, very cool guy, though. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, so yeah, obviously no Seb quite quite well by now, and uh, it was a cool episode. So good cool, man. Well, as well. Thanks for that. I appreciate you coming on again. And uh, yeah, obviously we're going to be talking about racing mostly, as that's what all the the fans and listeners want to want to hear about. And yeah, basically a bit about your story as well. So how did it all come about? I know you started racing in South Africa, and your dad had raced as well, who I was lucky enough to meet in in Kailami at the end of last year. So yeah, give us a bit of a synopsis on on how it all started. Yeah, so like you said, um, basically started with my dad in a couple of years ago. Um, he actually, it's quite an interesting story because he started with BMW in South Africa back in the day. Back in the day, they still had like a factory program going on. So he was always involved with them um, at a very young age. And that's always why it was always my dream to be part of BMW as well. That was like one of my goals to really uh, continue the family t- tradition, let's say, in, in BMW. And that's also why when I signed my contract, I was not only happy to be in DTM with BMW, but also just to be a factory driver for BMW. Um, I think the brand's got a lot of history. Um, and yeah, obviously uh, he actually stopped for us. So when me and my brother started, my brother started, I think two years before me uh, in 2003. Um, and then I joined shortly after, cause I obviously saw him at the racetrack and having loads of fun in his cart. And I was like, dad, uh, you definitely got to get me one as well and, and give me a chance. So then uh, I think it was in the beginning quite expensive, my dad as well, because he had to obviously run both of us in karting. And you guys know that karting is probably just getting more and more expensive every year. And uh, I think nowadays, especially the budgets you're looking at for one season in like WSK or something would be crazy. So I think we came in at the right time. Uh, in South Africa, luckily, the prices were a bit lower as well, so we could afford it. But once we got to Europe, things got really... Uh, high in budget let's say so it obviously got a bit harder yeah yeah how, how young did you start then if you start what 2005 i'm guessing if you were two years after your brother you said how young were you then yeah i think i was five or six years old um when i started so pretty uh yeah pretty early then yeah yeah very early very early um i think it's it's always good to start as early as possible because you know you see it now as well everything just starts younger so people are getting into f1 like lando at 19 for example Mm. And in my opinion, the younger you can start, the obviously the bigger advantage you have when you go up to bigger steps. And I think it was definitely the right choice to get me in as soon as possible, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right there. I mean, actually, if you say you started in 2005, you started the same year as I started, to give you an idea. Oh, really? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. And you're so how old now? You're... I'm th- I just turned 30. 30, so I'm yeah. nine years older. Nine years older, yeah. That just yeah, shows exactly. you But we started old. racing at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And and the first so the first steps like you said were the the VW or the Polo Cup out in out in South Africa and then you moved over and you were doing Audi, Audi TT Cup 2016 you said yeah uh, basically for me the move to Europe was very quick so things happened very quickly I went from two years of Polo Cup so my first two years of basically driving cars on the main circuit and not karting um, 
won both championships in South Africa and decided that it was the right step to move me to Europe. Um, by that time, it was actually the plan to do Sirocco Cup, as my brother did, um, okay. but then actually stopped the program and moved it to TT Cup, which was probably the best opportunity for me in a one make championship to really um, prove myself. And it's like for you as well in, in Carrera Cup, where you really, if you have a good team and everything behind you, in TT Cup, we didn't even have teams. Everything was run by the same guy or the same team, uh, which was apt at the time. And yeah, like, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably the perfect place to show what you can do. And I'm lucky enough that it worked out pretty well. I uh, finished fourth in the championship that year, had a lot of crashes uh, with, with Dennis Marshall uh, yeah. a couple of times. So that was also eventful. Um, but yeah, it's always just a good learning ground. And uh, I learned a lot for sure, um, especially just kind of in Europe, because things are so different there than uh, what we had in South Africa. Do you- so you're quite different because you didn't ever. Did you ever drive a single seater? No, never, mate. Never. Um, I basically went straight from karting to touring cars for po- like yeah. Polo Cup for two years, and like I say, it was always my my kind of wish to drive single seaters, but that chance just never really came because of budget reasons. And when you kind of <laughs> when you convert the rand into euros, it's it's a bit of a, a painful one. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah that wasn't always that possible one. for me. Yeah. No, that's cool, man. I mean, and so when you moved over, you moved over just with your brother. At what age were you? So it's quite a big move. Obviously, South Africa on a plane is 11 hours away. I presume you came over just you and him and and not your parents or your parents stayed mostly in South Africa. How did how did that all work out? Yeah. So like you said, my parents, it was quite tough at the time. And I remember I was like 17, I think, the the first time I came to Europe. And obviously you you live with him the whole your whole life. They help yeah. you with pretty much everything, your career, they build you up. And then all of a sudden they're like, all right, you're on your own now, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow, I would say, but it's definitely something that I'm so happy about now because it learns you, it teaches you to be uh, very independent in a way. Yeah. And I've been here for three, four years now, and I've learned so much just by kind of having to do everything on my own. Um, so yeah, I think it was definitely the right move. My brother moved here two years before me and then I moved in with him and that's the reason we live together now as well. Um, and it's one and a half hours away from Munich where we stay now. So for me, it's perfect to get to BMW headquarters and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't think I would move in the next year at least. Let's, let's put it that way. No, no, it wouldn't make sense. So that's, I mean, it was, I guess, pretty handy to have your older brother there so he can come and almost be second dad if you know what I mean when you came over yeah. you know 17 leaving home is quite a big deal um even if you're just leaving in the same country you know what I mean whether and if you're yeah. traveling 11 hours across the world to come and race it's a big commitment and yeah like you said I think it's really helped in the long run in terms of being independent and you've got that extra maybe hunger and desire to make sure it works for you you know yeah exactly um in the beginning it was actually <laughs> quite annoying with my brother kind of telling me what to do all the time you know eventually I was like mate piss off now you know just let me do my <laughs> thing just let me get on um but in the end it was also good to have his guidance he's got obviously two or three years more on me so he's got a bit more experience and it's also nice to just share especially driving wise I think we're, we're quite open in that sense where we'd look at each other's videos for example or dates or whatever we'd be like yeah you can break it late here I, I see this you know and I think that's quite handy to have nowadays yeah, I, th- I think we we'll probably all agree that once you start leaving your, your home country to race, like you notice how much it matures you. Um, even just being in the paddock, start working with adults, you know, telling adults what you want from the car, um, you know, checking yourself into hotel rooms and collecting rental cars yourself and driving yourself to the track. I think you really, I, I really noticed it for sure. So I can't imagine what it would have been like, you know, just coming over and, and learning that yourself in a whole new place. Yeah, exactly. Like you said, it's small things like, renting a car or taking a flight on your own booking your own stuff um yeah. where my mom probably always used to do that for me and now i had to take over uh in that sense so definitely learned a lot like i said i um, happy that i made the move when i did and yeah here we are three three years later now in, in europe and uh living the dream in germany <laughs> yeah fully living the dream so back to your audi days before the glory days obviously of bmw um we have you being teammates actually in gt masters with your brother how was that as a obviously it's great you get to travel together race together learn off him and he'd been in gt3s already for a little bit and had more experience was that a good yeah 
kick up the arse, so to speak, in terms of being able to get to a high level because you could always bounce things off each other or how was the relationship uh, yeah, doing during those seasons? Um, it was a very cool season. Um, I, I remember it was, it was always very close. Honestly speaking, um, there was never really a dominant, either me or him being faster all the time. It was very evenly matched. Um, so, for example, one race I'd be quicker, one race he'd be quicker. So it was very, I was really surprised at how we were always within one or two tenths of each other. Um, and in that sense, I think we were pushing each other along quite a lot. Um, he had a lot more experience in GD3 than I did. So I think he was a bit more of an all-rounder. I was good at putting the lap together and qualifying. But sometimes, you know, in the race, I'd, I'd not really do the move when I should have, or I would not really block if I, when I should have. Um, so it was, uh, it was pretty much just race craft that I needed to kind of get from him. And uh, he was very good at that. He was always get very good at racing. And I think I could have learned a lot from him that year. Um, we lost the championship by one point as well, which is really oh, painful to this day. Yeah, literally one point. <laughs> We had a really start, a slow start to the season, I remember, um, just getting up to speed. The team was also finding their feet with setup and so on. And I think we won uh, three of the last six races or something like that. And that really put us in contention with a Porsche of Engelhardt and them at the time. And it was just not enough. But yeah, obviously, you can imagine finishing. I think we won the last race, but it didn't even feel like a win because if you lose the championship by one point, it's just man, it's, it's a big disaster, to be honest. So we would have really liked to to win that together that was always our dream but i'm sure we'll get another chance in the future and it's still i'm still very proud of what we did that season I, i've lost the championship by one point in easy car but i don't think it's really the same <laughs> <laughs> as the gt masters <laughs> same feeling same feeling still first crack yeah, yeah it still the, stay, stays with me to be honest yeah at the time it's crazy like when you do something like for example if it's in karting and it's a really low championship at the time, it feels like your whole life is falling apart. Yeah. Mm. And then now, when you look back at the bigger picture of things, it's it's such a small part of your career, and you're like, man, it, it, what, it wouldn't even have made a difference if you did win mate, the championship, you know? Mate, I remember I remember the race where I lost it, and it's like it's a little track in Norfolk in Ello Park, and I lost it by driving over a puddle on slicks on the first lap, and it stays in me. It was nine years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's always oh, those little man. ones that do stay with you, isn't it? It's always those exactly. little niggle right away with you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, and then after that, so did you do, when did you start your driving around the Nordschleife? Because obviously we've been yeah, now within BMW a little bit. I'm skipping a few steps here. Um, we, we raced together on the Nordschleife and whatnot. But when did you first drive uh, the Nordschleife and what car was it in? And how did you progress up to GT3s on the Nordschleife? Um, I think my first time on the North Schleifer was in 2018, so the same year as what I did GT Masters. Um, I started in, I think you have to start in one of these V3 classes, which is basically like a, just below a GT4 car. Um, and that was in actually a, one of these really slow Porsches, man. And I remember that for me, this car was actually so much harder to drive than a GT3, for example, because it's got zero grip. It's on like road tires. And I remember you have to follow like the, the instructor or two or three laps, yeah. I think it is. Um, and it started raining and we went slicks. And literally myself and Max Hofer was with me during the course. We couldn't keep up with the freaking lead car that we were like, guys, this cannot be like, we literally couldn't keep up with the guy that was leading us for the, for the three laps. And he was obviously not pushing either. He was in like a road car or whatever. But I felt like a complete idiot that day because I was literally losing traction, sliding all over the place, trying to keep up. And the guy must have thought, wow, this is going to be a long day with these boys. So, yeah, I was close to almost doing a few chassis a couple of times. But, uh, yeah, we, we got through it in the end. So that was quite an eventful experience, I'd say. Yeah, the, your first laps around the Norge Dive, obviously, Alex, we're yet to take you around there, mate. But we will when everything's oh, opened up. Uh, so you can kind of see what it's like. But Jake knows and ha has had a, a, serious, oh, mate. a bit of I've an had, experience. I've had a, sim I've had a similar <laughs> experience. In, 20, in 2014, I did one bit or two maybe in the 235. Um, so I think you, you're mentioning like the GT4, aren't you, or the Cayman or something like that? Yeah, the Cayman, the um, Cayman, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think it's I think it races in the same class as the 235. I'm not sure, but anyway, same thing. Go out on the first time and it slicks in and it starts raining. Um, it's horrendous. It took me. I can't remember how long it took me. It started at the start of the lap, so I think it took me like 10 minutes to get back or 11 minutes or something. Something stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Nick, you can kind of back me up on that one. Even in a G3 car now. Uh, when it starts raining you can only really be the asshole in that situation yeah. um it's 
yeah, I remember just obviously fast forwarding now to last year's 24 hour race when it started raining and there was a red flag. And at the time I was really comfortable in the car. I mean, you're never really comfortable around the Nordschleife. You've always got a massive moment about 10 million times a lap. But um, uh, they, I agree so say that, you know, he, he would want me to do the rest of the start when it did go green again. And I was not sure about it, man, because it can go wrong so easily. You can obviously look like the hero if it goes right. But at the same time, you can really look like an idiot if you crash the car and something. And yeah, that was that was my biggest fear. So there's a lot of fear around the Nordsch life, I feel, especially in those conditions. You, you really have to put everything together. Um, but yeah, that, that was definitely the craziest 24 hour I've had last year. Um, I'm sure yeah. you've you've driven those conditions as well. It was literally insane. Yeah, well, we were actually, funny story, obviously we're missing a few steps here, but funny story between that, me and Sheldon were actually doing pretty similar stints. I was in the Rover car and he was in the Schnitzer car and my reference was him and his reference would have been me, (laughs) engineers. And I know he's engineer and he'll know my engineer. So I was being told, okay, he's done this sector, this sector. And it was just level pegging for like two hours, just literally flying. And I mean, I was in the limit I was almost off every corner just pushing flat out and I I just knew <laughs> that he would have been doing the same so I was laughing in my helmet like I was like man I, how I imagine if you'd both gone off yeah I know both <laughs> gone off <laughs> trying to imagine. chase each other's laptops yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's it's coming, yes. to the, coming to the pits to say well I'm oh, sorry I was chasing Nick and Nick goes sorry I was chasing Sheldon <laughs> <laughs> vice versa man yeah, yeah. Of, uh, yeah I don't think we'd have been in that much uh, good books in BMW then but that would it was completely nuts. Um, actually, Simsy took the restart, and then I jumped in again after. But yeah, it was it was nuts. So if we right, rewind a few years after your GT Masters thing, the first time I we actually met each other would have been at the DTM Young Drivers Test at the end of 2018, if I'm right. Yeah, correct. Uh, 2018. Yeah, right. Um, that was actually like you said, the first time we met. Uh, remember, it was a super cool experience. Nick Katzberg was there as well. Uh, yeah. Mikkel Jensen, uh, it yeah. was us four. Um, and I don't know if you can remember, but like we only got half a day of testing back in the day. <laughs> and that was, I mean, for me coming from a GT3 car, never having driven something with downforce or anything, it was a big shock to the system. Um, so I think you obviously felt a lot more comfortable than I did. I was just driving as fast as I could uh, back at the time. It was very uncontrolled. I remember my long runs were, <laughs> yours were a lot better than mine. <laughs> That's all I remember. <laughs> My tire deck was massively high on the rear because I was just literally slamming the throttle on exits and not really um, taking care of the Hankook tire, which is not, as we know, the best tire in the world. Um, so, yeah, that was that was quite an eventful one. But um, th- those cars were amazing to drive. Um, for me, I think the V8s were probably even a, a bit better than the, than the new cars, the turbo engines, um, purely because of the sound. You know, I remember putting my earplugs in and just, getting out of the car and your ears are still zinging just from the noise and those high RPMs that you're constantly at. So that was a really cool experience for me. Yeah. I mean, that, that week was really good. And to be honest with you, mate, you, you were very impressive, particularly on the, on the short runs, like you say, for not having much experience with downforce. I can remember coming out the the garage and seeing your lap time. I was like, Phew. He's definitely spent that <laughs> because I wasn't expecting, to be honest, I wasn't expecting it. So you definitely did a really good job on particularly one lap stuff. You were, yeah, clearly very, very impressive straight away. And that's why you got the gig. So yeah, fair play to you. It was, it was good. And then with Nicky, obviously he was really fast, particularly on the long runs, if I remember. Yeah, um, and Mika was fast, fast as well. But I agree with you. I preferred the, the V8s to the turbos, having got the opportunity to drive both because I did the end of 19 test for BMW as well, just to get laps on the, on the new car that we were trying to get sorted for last year, which was the last year. So um, good times. And Jake, you were actually there in 2018, like Sheldon said as well, weren't you in, in the Merc? Yeah, I, I was the last person to drive the Merc. Um, yep. So, yeah, I, I love DTM, to be fair. I, did, I mean, I, I drove it twice before, in, in a, not in the same way, but in, um, in the Autosport Award we have here in the UK, the Young Driver Award. Uh, we drive a Formula 2 car, GT3 car, DTM car. But, yeah, um, Merc had just left DTM. Um, and I, I was already told before the test that it was just going to be a test. Um, so he's like licensed to go out and send it basically um, <laughs> so I, and it was the last one I know no one was driving after me so it was like well, I don't want to crash it but yeah. no one's <laughs> going to drive can. it again so. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of can if I need to <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly but you enjoyed that experience as well then did you 
Yeah, it was, I mean, it's like a single seat of a roof, isn't it, really? Um, it's, I mean, obviously, Sheldon meant to touch on earlier, you didn't drive one before that, but um, I mean, I, I've driven at that point in Formula 3 for two or three years and GT3 and Formula 3, I mean, and, it, it, you know, it was like sitting in a, apart from the fact you had a roof, it was like straight away at home. Um, and they were just, they were so cool to be honest. They were just so cool to even just sit in, to be honest. You sat so far back in the car, like the, the bonnet felt like it was about a mile away. Um, and I, I don't know, I just loved it. I wish it's that I wish Merca stayed around a long time, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's all changed the landscape of everything now, hasn't it? Um, but I, I completely agree with you. And actually, I mean, I found it quite difficult jumping back in in 2018 and maybe didn't send it quite hard enough on my first laps in particular because I come back up from driving a Carrera Cup car where you've got to be yeah. quite careful. And I didn't extract the most of it, particularly on my first few runs. So it shows how impressive, mm. you know, the thing was. So if we go on yeah. to, obviously, your first races, Sheldon, in DTM as a full-time, obviously, you get the big contract. It's amazing. It's what everyone's always wanted to get a DTM contract. But actually, to be the bigger thing is to get a manufacturer backing, which you did with BMW, which is great. How did it feel sitting on the grid? I think it was Hockenheim, I presume, was the first race for you. Yeah. How was the whole experience? Did you have family there? How did the race weekend go? Ah, man, I remember the, the night before on the Friday night, uh, I think practice went pretty well on the first weekend. Um, it was raining a lot, I remember that weekend. And, oh, man, the, the Hankook tire in the wet is just <laughs> another <laughs> level. Yeah, it's another <laughs> level. And it's, the car's got so much power and obviously no TC or ABS. So you really, you got to be so smooth on throttle. We had different throttle maps to try and sort the problem out. And at the time, it was so risky. Aquaplaning, done the parabolic straight. Um, it, pretty much everything was happening. So it was a wild first experience of my first race weekend. Um, I think the first race was wet. Yeah, the, the first race was wet. Um, and yeah, I was obviously super nervous. Um, didn't really know what to expect. Uh, you're driving around a bunch of guys like Bruno Spengler, uh, Marco Wittmann, Timo Glock, the guys that you looked up to for your whole life pretty much. And now they're your teammates. You've you've got to beat them. They've got the same car as you. As you guys know, it's 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 always a goal to kind of beat your teammates. Uh, they're the only guys with the same car as you. And uh, these guys are so good, man. They've got so much experience. Um, I think where they really made a difference uh, was just in the races. You know, like I remember Bruno was a very very good racer as well. We were always in the pack together, and you could just see that he he had so much experience. Um, so I definitely learned a lot from them. Um, like I said, first races in the wet, uh, finished P6, I think, which was a massive confidence boost of myself as well, just knowing that I, I can do it. Um, and yeah, I didn't I didn't have a lot of experience before that. I did, uh, like I said, I did TT Cup, TCR in 2017 after TT Cup and GD Masters and then DTM. So I had three years in Europe in, yeah, and not the biggest championships starting with. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a big shock to the system, but I... I'm definitely thankful to BMW for taking that chance on me. Um, so yeah, um, I can definitely say that it was, there was a lot of mistakes in the first year, just because you don't really know what to expect and the car is big, it's overwhelming. Um, I had a couple of coming together with Timo that year, um, purely my own fault, you know, just kind of wanting too much from the car and from myself mainly, um, but just learn from that really and uh, really put it all together last year, I think. Do you think um do you think that like the fact that your progression was so quick it kind of helped you in a way? Because like I think we see sometimes drivers and riders they get put in at the deep end and they kind of go, Oh actually, I'm all right here and sink or swim. Sort. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, th I think it did in a way. Um again, it's like growing up in Europe from a young age, it really throws you in the deep end and you're willing to do anything to kind of keep up with it because you don't want to lose that opportunity. Um, but at the same time, it's again like the, the young driver test. I just wanted too much um, from the car, especially in the long run. So I was high on deg, uh, just pushed the car too much. The tire couldn't handle it really. And um, these are things that you can only learn over time, you know, by driving the car more. And we didn't have a lot of testing as well. I think we only had one test, one ITR test before the season. So it was very limited on testing. Um, and that made things hard as well. So it was definitely good being thrown in the deep end, but. I definitely, I mean, with it came mistakes, that's for sure. Um, I think it was not really, it's never expected, but you, you kind of accept it as well as a rookie um, because you know that you have a lot to learn, obviously. 
think I think everyone, um, especially myself, like loves about DTM is the level of competition involved. I mean, you know, the sort of recent format of having a race on Saturday and a race on Sunday, you could see the guy win the race on Saturday and then be, you know, P17 or whatever on the Sunday. And you're like, well, how, how is that possible? The same track, he's just won yesterday, stuck it on pole. Yeah. And it's just the level of competition. It's like you've got to be on it every single session. Yeah, the competition is super strong. Um, it's very hard, uh, like you said, from one day to the next, we'll have a perfect setup. Uh, the car will be working really well. You'll be really happy with it. Change nothing on the car. Um, get to Sunday's race, get in qualifying, and you're literally at the back. And you don't know why. You've changed nothing on the car. The balance is completely different. And you're kind of... DTM in, is very important with qualifying. Uh, you need to qualify up front. Otherwise, you really get stuck in that kind of error wash in the pack, and you cannot really do anything. Uh, you've got DRS, obviously, but um, it always comes back to you at the end if you, if you boost it all in the beginning. So... Yeah, track position is very important. And like I said, it's very, very different from day to day. Sometimes you're quick, sometimes you're not, and you don't really know why. And in a sense, that kind of annoyed me about DTM because sometimes I felt like I was driving better than the day before, but the result was not there at all. So mm. that really boggled my mind sometimes. Yeah, I can imagine. And it's all, yeah, like you say, it's also marginal. It's more like, more like F1. And off the back of that, I know who you work with as an engineer because I actually worked with him when he was at Force India right. racing point at the time, Robert Sattler. Did he help you through that quite a lot? Because obviously he has a huge amount of experiences and, and he's a super good engineer. How was your relationship, number one, with him? And how was it dealing? Obviously, you come from GT Masters where you have one engineer, a couple of mechanics. Now you have a team of engineers behind you at BMW you know, probably 20, 30 in the trucks listening to every word. You've got tire engineers, engine engineers, chassis engineers. How was it to, yeah, for you to be able to expand how you sort of talk to them and really get everything that you wanted across? Yeah, that was um, a very cool experience. Obviously, like you said, again, overwhelming. Um, coming from one engineer in GD Masters to three just on your car, and then you've got your mechanics and stuff. And that's also another aspect of DTM. Um, Whereas, you know, everyone's working for you only on one car. And I always try to adapt the, the kind of mindset that you need to really have a good relationship with your boys. And I think in the last two years, I had some tough times in the first year, like I said, um, where I really needed someone to, to build me up a lot. And uh, Rob was actually always by my side. He really, he really pushed me. Um, the thing is, he came from Gary Paffett. Uh, he did Gary Paffett in 2018. So they actually won the championship at DTM. So his expectations of me was obviously very high. Um, and obviously I wanted a lot. So I think in the beginning, we we're really pushing, you know, to get a race win and whatever. Um, but then we realized, okay, we need to maybe just take a step back, um, let everything kind of fall in place. Um, and he was very good at that. He was very good at motivating me. Um, I mean, Nick, you know, the guy as well. He's, he's a very cool guy to work with. And I think if it wasn't for him, I would have, struggled a lot more in DTM. He really guided me a lot, sat with me in the evenings, you know, went through data and stuff. And he was actually one of the biggest reasons probably that I've really come to grips with the car last year um, and had some very good results. So yeah, I can only thank him a lot for that. And I think he had a big role to play in, in kind of uh, helping me get used to the vibes in DTM. I, um, is, is he in Formula E now, by any chance? He is. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he because, is. because, because of yeah, yeah, that's it. Because I was in Saudi and uh, walking into the track, and uh, I was with Gary, and he starts stopped speaking to this guy, and he came, when he yeah. waited for him, he came back. He said, "Oh yeah, he was my engineer in DTM." Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. He's with Tom Blomquist now at Neo, so yeah, yeah that's kind of cool for him as well, just to get experience of uh, kind of everything in motorsport, you know. It's super yeah. small world, isn't it? You always meet these people at some point again, and I, I mean, yeah. I mentioned him in particular because I I knew how hard he worked in terms of he'd just sit there all night if he had to and pick through every little thing and then relay it back to a driver if needs be. Um, and I'm sure that was really beneficial, particularly in DTM when everything is so marginal in terms of, you know, if you're point one of toe out or bar difference in tire pressures, you can then be, instead of putting it on pole, you can be 12th. So having someone like him yeah. in the first year, although he's teaching you because of the lack of experience, it's great to have someone that's already been there and done it with a champion like Gary Paffett um for you just to you know sponge off yeah exactly um i was very lucky that he had a lot of experience as well from mercedes so he could bring a lot of knowledge from there into bmw um i think that was also an important reason for bmw to sign him with rbm 
is that he could kind of bring all those tricks from from the winning manufacturer from the year before. Um, and yeah, I really gained a lot of value from that. Like I said, um, we had a lot of contact throughout the year. Um, I'm not always the guy to to really get into a proper relationship with the engineer as like friends or whatever. But I think this time it was really different. Like we really spoke on a daily basis and not just about racing all the time, you know, most of the time it was probably about frigging girls or I don't know even what, what it was, you know, but it was just, uh, was a very open-minded relationship that I had with him. And I think that was also important to kind of grow together in a sense. No, completely, yeah. completely. Nice. So how are, obviously now with um, DTM changing over, um, it's like a new era for DTM, obviously we're taking on the GT3 regs. Um, I mean, I'm not going to ask what you're doing in terms of your racing, but what's kind of your opinion on it? Like, Obviously, I think we all would, would have liked to keep the DTM cars, you know, the, the current generator, 2019, 2020 generation yeah. cars. Um, but, you know, such is the world. So what, what's your kind of take on it? Um, I mean, obviously, coming from the Class 1 car, it's those cars are amazing. It's probably the best car I'll ever drive in my career. Um, so definitely, at the beginning, when you hear that uh, DDM is going to go to GT3 cars, you definitely feel like, shit, you know, it's all over now and you don't really have that opportunity to get back in the car again. But at the same time, dude, I think it's uh, it's a new beginning for DTM. I think the racing is going to be a lot better for sure um, because you've got more manufacturers involved now. Um, I think everything's going to be a lot closer because let's be honest, last year wasn't, it was a bit of a one-man show up front with Audi kind of dominating um, a lot of the races. Um, so I think it's going to bring the racing on a higher level now. Um, I think the fans want to see a lot of good drivers. I've already seen in the in the media now that a lot of good drivers are being confirmed for that. Um, so I think it's really the drivers that are going to bring the fans back to DTM and not really the cars. So I think you're just going to kind of accept that it's uh, GD3 cars now, which are still very cool cars to drive, don't get me wrong, but I just think that uh, it'll obviously never be like, like the Class 1 cars used to be. And um, I think the Class 1 cars were actually probably the, the closest to F1, in my opinion in terms of the level and the teams, the way they operate mm. it and stuff like that. So, um, Well, I mean, I think the, the same regs in Japan, isn't it? With Super GT. Yeah, yeah. I think GT500. Very close, yeah. Very so, close. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, saw, I saw a stat somewhere last year where in Fuji, I think the, the, the GT500 car was quicker, the Toyota GT500 car was quicker than the Allen P1 Toyota in Fuji. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. When they were BOP, yeah, it's true. And also, obviously, the Super GT cars run on some mad bridge stones that are like <laughs> super, super soft. So cornering speed, are <laughs> unbelievable. But Super yeah. GT is that something, Sheldon, that you would obviously off the back of DTM and the DTM going to GT threes? Obviously, we know BMW aren't going to go and do do Super GT. But is that something that took your fancy, maybe to do a, a dual program at some point, or is it just too difficult to to try and yeah work both over there and over here? Um, it was definitely something that I considered at the end of last year because I wanted to obviously, like you said, the, the cars are amazing. So I wanted to naturally continue driving these kind of cars with high downforce in a touring car style platform. Um, so that was definitely something I was looking at. But in the end, my only fear was that if I do go there, that you kind of get lost off the radar in a sense, cool. where if you do go to Japan, people really in, in Europe forget about you in a sense. So that was probably my biggest fear of going there and I think it's all a mega championship I was speaking to Sasha Fenestras in in Riyadh as well and he's doing that full-time now and he said it's an awesome championship to be in uh I think the manufacturers invest a lot of money in there as well um especially from the Japanese market so it's definitely a cool uh, cool thing that I would still like to do in the future I just think that now it's important for for us as young young racing drivers to to be current and to really be in Europe you know um to kind of uh, keep your name relevant like i said yeah I, th I think if you're ultra successful out there it can work for you probably if you look at like right. like nick, nick cassidy obviously now got a uh, full-time driving formula e off the back of it but you know there's not many like him exactly i think if you're already established like uh andre lotter or james rossiter who they were also over there at the time they were already established so for them it was just uh, a good experience and kind of building on their cv but i think as a young driver, you, you really try and build your CV in Europe. And then if the chance does come, you move over there, I think. Yeah, it's, but it's a shame because like to, to, they have two of the best driving car championships out there, you know, yeah. GT500 and Super Formula. Um, I mean, Super Formula really should be Formula 2, the car. 
Um, yeah, but, yeah, I think the car is very similar. Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, it, but it, they do look so cool to drive. And speaking with Nick, they say he says it's the same as well. Um, that that would be, you know, something he would miss after leaving Japan, definitely. Yeah, and he's actually doing DTM. So if we go back to that, obviously, Sheldon, you had you had your pole, you had your first win, which was Assen in the wet. Yeah, if correct. I remember, how correct, was the yeah. feeling of that? Obviously, a, a big release of. Yeah, pressure off your shoulders because you've done the business. You've won the first race, the first race for a South African to win in DTM as well. I don't. Yeah. I think we we spoke off camera a little bit. It wasn't the youngest ever winner. You just missed out on that one, but still mighty impressive. How was that whole weekend's experience? And did the pressure really come off your shoulders after after you got that win? Yeah, it was uh, actually the weekend started off really badly. Um, so it was actually my worst weekend up until that stage. On, on Friday, we struggled all weekend. It was the same in 2019. For some reason, I was just not quick there. I don't know why. Um, we struggled. I was like second last, third last, you know, really just struggling to get into the top 15. Um, it was dry on Friday. It was dry on Saturday. And then Sunday, I think the qualifying was dry, if I remember correctly. But uh, obviously, didn't get right in the dry. So qualified right at the back. P14, I think it was. Um, and before the race, I was not even nervous or anything because I knew that we could only kind of move up from there. It was not like I was starting up front. And, you know, obviously, naturally, if you start up front, you have a lot more to lose. Uh, so I was super chilled on the grid. I didn't really have any expectations, just wanted to kind of get through it. It was a bad weekend up until then. I uh, didn't really score a lot of points in the first race. Um, so I just wanted to get through the weekend. And then all of a sudden, the race started. Um, I was, I got an okay start. I think I maintained my position, didn't really move up anything. Um, and then from there onwards, the car just got better and better and better and it started to dry up slowly. Um, there was no more rain. And all of a sudden, I found myself just moving forwards. You know, the car was mega good. I had so much traction. I could just really overtake people without sitting behind them for too long. You know, when you just feel good on the day and the car just works, um, everything kind of fell into place. And all of a sudden it got drier. Rob came on the radio because it was yellow flag. So you're allowed to talk on the radio. Um, for viewers that don't know in DTM, we don't, we're not allowed radio communication to the driver um, unless it's yellow flag or it's red flag. Um, so regarding safety and yeah, it was yellow flags. Rob said, we're actually in contention for the lead now. Cause at that time, I think the first three had boxed, including Robin who was leading at the time. And he said to me, we're in contention for the lead. And I was like, what? Like I didn't even reply to that. Cause I was so, lost in the situation that I didn't even know what he was talking about. So I just kept on driving, driving, driving. And yeah, eventually I saw Robin coming out on the pit exit and I literally went around the outside of him. He had cold tires. So he had no chance against me. Um, who was already on hot tires for like three or four laps. So when I saw that overtake happen, I was like, shit guy, we're actually in the lead, you know? And yeah, from there onwards, it was very tricky again. Cause I think it was safety car as a massive shunt by the WRT. Uh, cause it started raining heavily again. And I was worried cause we had old tires at the time and, uh, Robin had boxed like three or four laps later. So I thought with fresher tires, he would catch up in the wet. Um, which wasn't the case. Still, our car was very strong, managed to even manage the tire while, while setting some good lap times and the safety car came out and that was when my heart stopped. I was like, shit, you know, like all that hard work that I've put in now of managing the tire and everything is gone. The guys are going to close up to me, have hot tires and have an advantage on the tire. So, yeah, that's when Rob came on the radio to me and said, just stay calm. Uh, we, we've got this. The pace is very good. Um, it was red flag. We had the restart. I remember I was so freaking nervous on the on the grid, man. I didn't even know where to look or to talk to anyone or anything. Um, and, yeah, the, the race restarted. And it went very well. Uh, got a good restart and pretty much just managed it to the end there. So, it was kind of weird, like I said, because the weekend started off so badly and I was really off the pace. And in the wet, the car just seemed to have worked. I don't know if the platform was just too soft or something. And that's the reason it was so bad in the dry and so good in the wet. But um, yeah, it was just an amazing day for me. Obviously, thinking back at it now, still getting a lot of goosebumps, just thinking that I'm a DTM race winner. Um, that's obviously was yeah. my dream for a long time. And just to achieve that now is is very cool. Makes all moving from South Africa all those years ago worth it all of a sudden, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Moment. Yeah, exactly. That was, um, we took a big risk coming from South Africa, obviously, with DTM um, in mind all the time. And 
like you said, moments like those, you really realize it was all worth it in the end. And I'm um, very happy that it did work out the way it did because I'm sure it could have gone the other way as well and I could have been stuck back in South Africa again. So very, very yeah. grateful for that. <laughs> it all happens for a reason, doesn't it? Were, your, were yeah. your parents there or were they just tuned in from South Africa? No, they were actually watching on TV. I called them straight after on FaceTime and my mom was in tears, uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. So, yeah, it was all very emotional, but uh, they've supported me along the way, uh, myself and my brother. And like I said, it's not easy to support two brothers, um, especially from a budget point of view in the beginning of the year or at the beginning of our careers. Um, so, yeah, big respect to them as well for, for doing that. Yeah, it seems like they've done a good job. So yeah, <laughs> congrats to them as well. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Um, so moving forwards now, obviously the DTM era is, as in as we knew it, is now over and, and we've gone to this new regs, um, GT3 cars. How do you find, obviously you're a factory driver for BMW still, you're combining yeah. that with the reserve role in Formula E while BMW is still involved. Um, obviously you're mixing between the two. So I, I presume you've tested the, the Formula well, the Formula E car for BMW. So was that your first crack in a, in a single seater when you had a little rollout or something? Yeah, it was actually. Um, yeah. Also very different experience for me. Um, felt cool, you know, just to kind of sit behind the halo and have the vision of a, of a Formula car for once. Uh, always dreamed of it really. So for me, it was just a cool feeling to really just have that seat position and just feel like you're one with the car. Um, but obviously very different experience. Uh, the car doesn't really have a lot of grip. Uh, I think Jay can also elaborate on that. I'm sure you've driven the car already at the young driver test a couple of times. Uh, car just pretty much slides around the rear. So it's, for me, the best comparison is like a rental car. Uh, as funny as it sounds. <laughs> pretty much sending it as hard as you can. And uh, yeah, I mean, the car is, for me, a lot of fun to drive. I haven't really driven something crazy and formula. So for me, it's, uh, it's a very cool car to drive. And I think it's uh, definitely an exciting championship for the future. I mean, I really enjoy it, to be honest, every time I've driven one. I mean, if you look at it on paper and you go, well, it's like, you know, it's getting on for 900 kilos or something. Um, there's no downforce. It's on some treaded tyres. Um, you know, it's electric. And you think that doesn't look like it'd be good fun at all. But then you pull it on, especially on a street track. Um, and it just, it seems, because it's always moving, because there's a lot of cambers in the road, um, various levels of grip, you can climb all over the curbs. You know, you're close to the walls. It's like the sensation of speed and just sort of hustling the car feels... I mean, in Marrakesh, in, especially on qualify mode, and Marrakesh isn't even, for people who don't know Formula E, it's a street track, but it's not like as street track as some of the other places Formula E goes. It's not as tight. And even there, the car feels rapid in qualifying mode, to be honest. Um, so I, I really like it. But it's, it's, gonna be, it's, uh, it's interesting how it's, how it's going to all fall into place over the next few years with Formula E, for sure. Yeah, yeah I think th that'll be very interesting to see where the championship goes. Um... It's got very good drivers in it again. Um, so in a sense, I think the fans are kind of in it for the drivers as well. Uh, pretty much similar to what's happening to DTM at the moment. I think in the end, you really attract the fans and the viewers from, from the drivers and the lineups that are there. So I think that's what's really attractive about Formula E. If you look at the lineups this year, it's just, I don't think there's one weak link in, in anyone's lineup. So there's some world-class drivers and that's, that's still a target for me, to be honest. Um, would still like to to break into Formula E as a, as a permanent driver at some point. Um, so yeah, just uh, pushing on and hoping that uh, that can happen in the next couple of years. Yeah, well, obviously BMW, well, obviously BMW have committed to leaving now. Um, so yeah. I think, and I, I believe Andretti are going to stay for season eight. Um, you know, I think the, the powertrains are homologated for season eight. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess for you, it's kind of like you know trying to get into another test, hopefully the rookie test in a, in, a month, in six weeks time or however long it is in two months time, um, and trying to prove yourself and try and get a race here. I guess I mean it's pretty similar for myself. Yeah, um, like you said, the rookie tests are a good chance for drivers to kind of um, show what they can do to other teams as well. Um, so that's definitely um, an aim of mine as well. Let's say and uh, yeah, let's see where it goes. Um, I'm definitely very keen on the idea. That'd yeah. be cool. How, a question from driving sort of stuff. I've done a little bit of sim work in, in the Formula E and I found it really quite not, well, yeah, actually difficult to go from listening to your beeps and, and being very smooth and looking after the power train and, and all the electricity whilst doing a good lap time to then suddenly saying, okay, you've got full power in one lap, put it together. How did you find that? Obviously, 
you, I, I presume you haven't tested on a full street circuit. It will be a, a test track, so you don't have the walls and whatnot. So maybe I can ask the question to both Sheldon and Jake. How is that as a reference point thing? Because for the for the listeners, you'll actually be going the opposite of what you usually do in qualifying. So usually you'll be breaking a bit later in qualifying. Yeah. And actually you're going to have to break a bit earlier because you're arriving so much faster with all the power. So how, how do you yeah, compartmentalize all that in your head? <laughs> yeah, that's actually one of my best explanations of Formula E kilowatt runs is that there's no fuel load or anything. So the car doesn't get any lighter in qualifying. It's pretty much just more power. So you've got to break earlier, like you said. Um, and the thing about Formula E weekends is you fly all the way across the world. You go to Hong Kong, you go to Diria, for example. You only have one shot of it or two shots in qualifying, obviously, um, in the group stages where if you if you don't get that one lap together, you lock up in turn one or, you know, you you touch the wall or something. Your your weekend's pretty much over because let's be honest, if you start at the back, you, you have no chance. So um, in a sense, it's it's very knife edge, the car to drive. It, it locks the front extremely easily. Um, and it, everything's just very sensitive. But what I like about formula is that you can really feel everything. So because you're in a cockpit that doesn't really have a lot of damping and stuff, you feel everything through your ass. And that's what you don't have. That's a sens sensation you don't have in GT3 cars um, is really feeling you know, everything. You don't have power steering, so you feel everything to the steering wheel. It's heavy. Uh, a guy with skinny arms like me sometimes struggles to hang on to it for a long run. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very cool. And Jake? Yeah, I mean, I mean I've only, uh, like Sheldon, I've only done it in a test, but I mean, in, in terms of like the short run, sort of, mm -hmm. let's say a qualifying mode on, on the, all the powers, you know, it, it is still a race car from a sense, you know, it's got four wheels, a brake, a throttle and a steering wheel. So you drive to the limit of grip you, you have. Um, but definitely the, the, strength, the strange part about that is the braking system, I would say. Um, I mean, all teams have different versions of, of their own, but, you know, it's not the braking shape and the braking style is completely different. Like Sheldon says, it locks very easily. You can't apply anywhere near the amount of brake pressure I would be used to in something like Formula 3, for example, and definitely Sheldon's used to in DTM. But once you get your head around that, that you can't do it and, you know, you limit yourself to that, it's kind of, you know, not straightforward, but the, the difficult bit at that point becomes adjusting the power modes and doing it on that one lap. Um, not, you know, getting the limit out of it whilst not making a mistake. I mean, I feel like I'm kind of used to that with GP3 on Pirelli's. Um, you know, you get two or three laps tops in qualifying where you go out, out prep, push, and that's it. You know, then you box. So kind of get prepared for it from that. But I think I think the hard part about Formula E is definitely the race simulations. Um, you know, even just driving around the track by yourself, you know, following the beeps and the, the lift and post beeps that you get in the car, trying to maximise the lap time by saving the energy and, you know, doing all the various switch changes and radio chats or um, as you're going around and trying to do all that. And then you think, wow, so if, if you go into a race situation, you've got another 23 cars trying to trying to do all that as well. Whilst there's no error wash in the championship, so everyone's nose to tail. Um, there's yellow flags, FCYs, people hitting the wall, and the cars themselves are quite strong to a point, so they, you can bump and barge a little bit. It, the mental spare mental capacity you must need um, to extract the most out of it is probably up there as the most the highest in any championship i would think yeah it seems that way from from an outside point of view it just seems like a completely different way of going about a race weekend in general and about maximizing that one lap thing because the power change that's something you don't yeah. usually get that in any other yeah. formula to be able to turn up from say whatever 200 watts to 250 watts of power just yeah. for a qualifying lap, yes, you get your one lap of doing that, but actually arriving when you're going 15, 20 kph faster yeah. is usually not a normal thing. So it's readjusting. It, it is weird because you you would think that you you know it just it's it's weird to just change the dial and you all of a sudden you've got 20 percent more power, 25 percent more power, <laughs> and you just get a kick in the head and you're like, well, I've only changed the steering wheel. Like where yeah. were you earlier? <laughs> sort of thing. Um, but I think. You'd think it would be easy, wouldn't you? Just change your braking point a little bit. But, you know, such is the moment in qualifying, I think, that you can see with some rookies in Diria that, you know, they're very quick on 200 kilowatts in practice. And then they move up to that one lap on 250 and the braking points have changed, but they're trying to still, you know, there's that inner thing in your mind still saying, oh, you can brake a bit later or you can stay on that brake point, but you'll mess it up. Um, and it's just... I think that's where the experience comes in, definitely, or where the experience helps with some guys. But 
you know, I think you have to be quite pragmatic in Formula E, I think. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. So moving forward, Sheldon, you're staying with BMW, obviously, like we talked about for this year. Uh, you're going to be doing some GT stuff. I know we can't talk about plans, as neither can I, because it's nothing's completely concrete oh, or, or announced. Um, <laughs> how are you feeling all about that? Obviously, it'd be GT3s now, whatever you do. Uh, we'd race together in Kailami, your home circuit, um, at the end of last year, where you were, I must say, rapid, um, <laughs> hammered me <laughs> um, in quali. So how was that weekend? Obviously, you, you turned up being the local, you won the race and helped Nikki and Augusto win the championship. Um, that was a pretty mega event for you, right? Yeah, awesome event. Um, it was a bit of a shame for me as a local, um, kind of not having the fans and stuff there. That's obviously what I was most looking forward to. Uh, just remembering from the year before, there were so many friends and family there and stuff, and no, none of them were able to be there. So that was a bit of a shame. Um, but the track itself, I mean, Nick, you know as well, I think it's it's an awesome track. Um, yeah. It's it's probably one of my favorites of the GT3 calendar, not only because it's in South Africa, but it's just, it's a lot of high speed, which suits the M6 quite well. Um, and then the torrential rain uh, was was there as well at the end, which which we luckily gave to Nikki to drive. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was happy to not be in the car um, at that point. But uh, no, I think yeah, obviously it's very cool to to win my home race. I think for myself, my brother and Jordan, it was uh, a big goal of ours to win our home race. And uh, obvious, obviously, it was a bit of a uh, let's say premature end to the race with a kind of safety car and uh, the heavy rain and stuff but it was definitely an awesome feeling to to win with them and Nicky and Augusto winning the championship as well was was mega so um yeah very very happy for them and obviously also one of my my big achievements that's on my CV and something I'm really proud of as well yeah being a South African I can imagine that you are super proud of that it was really cool to see you obviously just jump in because of, you come from doing the DTM last year and then straight in a GT3 car where we know you're fast anyway but to come in and help BMW do that after already winning the Nordschleife earlier in the year and having actually a really good year for the M6, considering its life as a GT3 car. Um, and then winning the Intercontinental GT Championship, it was mega. Uh, Kyle Army in general was awesome. One of my favourite tracks I've ever yeah. been to. Um, what is your favourite track, if you had to choose? And what is your favourite track-car combo um, and why? Oh, that's that's quite a tough question. Yeah, um, on the spot there. On the yeah, spot. Yeah, definitely Have on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I mean, the Norch Life is not really a fair comparison, to be honest, because it's so different to any other GP track that you ever drive. Um, I would definitely say that is number one, though, because it does still count as a racetrack, so you kind of need to factor it in. Yeah. Um, okay, then, well, if we talk without that, then we, we take the Norch Life. Norch Life is always king. But after that, if we talk yeah. GP tracks or normal tracks, what would it be then? Um, I would definitely say Spa is up there as one of my favorites. Um, it's quite a cliched one as well. I think most drivers love Spa, um, especially in the DTM car. That was amazing going through a Rouge, which is pretty much flat out in qualifying. And uh, yeah, you're super scared going down into a Rouge in the DTM car. I remember that was one of the craziest experiences I ever did. Um, but a cool track that I drove as well in 2018, and I did IMSA as well um, in America. I did the four endurance races with, uh, with Land Motorsport and the Audi. Yeah. And I did Sebring as well, which was really cool to drive. A, a very bumpy, obviously, not a lot of uh, runoff, which I'm not really a fan of, um, as I'm sure most of us aren't. Um, and Watkins Glen was very cool as well. So uh, also a track with very high grip, uh, very smooth, um, a lot of high speed corners in the Audi where um, the car is very edgy on the rear and stuff. So it's a big challenge to the driver. So I'd say probably the tracks in America are very cool. Road Atlanta, also a very cool track. Um, it's hard to pinpoint which track is my favorite, but I would say uh, the American tracks are definitely up there in terms of um, just giving the driver that thrill, you know. Yeah, they're old school, aren't they? I got that. Uh, yeah. I got that late call to replace uh, Bill when he got COVID at the end of yeah. last year with, in Sebring, and they they called it the American Norge Life because of the bumps and the different undulations, <laughs> and it's quite it's quite tricky. And I really enjoyed that race and the whole race experience in in America in general. It's a bit more relaxed and cut back. None of the no, no, let's say bullshit in terms of huge runoffs because no one likes those particularly the slightly older drivers I, I know none of them like the runoffs I prefer to if I make a mistake actually get penalized for it not just drive around and game lap time is yeah. IMSA or the, the state something that you'd like to get back and do um definitely looking back at it I I think IMSA is definitely an option um that I would love to go back to um 
I would always try and combine that again with the European program, sure. uh, just purely because of the same reason, as I mentioned earlier with Japan and just staying on that radar on Europe. Um, but definitely something I would, I would enjoy doing again. Um, Daytona I did as well, which is an awesome race. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not such a, it's, it's a Mickey Mouse track, but I think the, the atmosphere at Daytona is really what gives the race that kind of vibe and stuff. So, uh, definitely something I would do again. Um, would like to race in America again and who knows, maybe we teammates in, in, uh, LMDH or something, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. I would love to be uh, well, number one teammates with you cause you're bloody fast and that would help. And then number two, <laughs> and number two, just the, yeah, race in America. I really enjoyed my time out there. It was, it was like really fun at that time. There was, um, still fans, but only at 50% at the end of last year in the, in the Florida state or Miami state. So you, you could get the atmosphere and it was still full and ramming. So that was good. And I think once we do get the fans back in Europe, it will be great. Because even the Nordschleife last year, you know, having great results and a, and a BMW won three, but there's no yeah. real fans apart from the team that have obviously put loads, uh, loads of work into it. It would be nice to get those back. I don't know how you feel about that, but it's just the fans really, really make the sport. Yeah, especially at the Nordschleife. Um, yeah. Freaking hell. I mean driving on the Norch life at night in the 24 hour and you smell the barbecues, <laughs> you see the, the, the drunk people like literally standing on the <laughs> fences and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, good boy. You know, <laughs> cheering for BMW. It's uh, it's a special feeling. Um, and it's one that you cannot really, um, yeah, you cannot have it without these fans. They are kind of what makes the race what it is. Uh, you arrive on the Wednesday or whatever it is uh, before the weekend and you see all these camper vans on the side, like millions of camper vans, just people, staying there for the whole weekend from Wednesday to Sunday. Um, and I think you've got to give it to Germany. They've got probably the most passionate fans um, or one of the most passionate fans in the world, I think. Um, the, especially at the Nürburgring, you know, a lot of people live there and they, they, I mean, they don't really have a lot of else going on in Nürburgring, <laughs> if, if, we, if we put it plainly. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very uh, um, isolated place. So for them, I think anything that happens there, they're just happy to, to kind of witness. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. You always come out of the hotel and there's people stood there, and it's the same people every time with the new photographs that they've yeah. taken of, of you at, I say, a Flans Garden or whatever taking mm -hmm. off, and it's really quite, it's quite a cool experience. If if we go to a bit of what you touched on with the potential of LMDH, um, just in general, what do you think to that new championship? Is it something you'd like to get involved of, involved in? Sorry, obviously you've got LMDH and LMH, which should take over um, the current LMP1. Uh, what's your thoughts on it? And again, I can see your brother, you know, doing some LMP2 stuff and trying to get involved more in, in the prototype sort of thing. So I guess he's trying to get, get, us, get his ass in an Audi. Um, yeah. But what's your thoughts on the whole situation there? Yeah, I think it's definitely something interesting for us um, in the next two or three years. Uh, I personally really hope that um, D, um, BMW enters um, as a manufacturer. I really hope that happens. I think it's uh, it's a big opportunity for all the brands to, uh, to enter a not so high budget series because the car's already there. It's pretty much just creating your own aero platform um, and the body shape. So I think it's definitely something very interesting for the manufacturer. I think for the driver, even more so um, really getting back into that factory racing, um, which I think I'll miss in the next two or three years uh, coming from DTM. I think sure. that's definitely gonna, uh, that's definitely something that I would love to have back again. Um, an all pro lineup with, um, you know, just factory drivers would be a mega uh, kind of thing to have. Um, and the cars are really cool to drive. I mean, my brother, like you said, drove the car in um, Abu Dhabi a couple of weeks ago. And he was saying that uh, the cars, I mean, the LMP2 at least is not really uh, that much of a step up because the car is still in low speed. It's still pretty much the same as the GT car. So it locks the rear a lot. And um, especially on old tires, it's a, it's a handful, he said. Um, so uh, definitely something I'm looking forward to. Um, I really, like I said, hope that uh, manufacturers really into that. And I'm sure you you have the same kind of feeling there um, that you would love to to get into that at some point if they do enter. Yeah, definitely. I think every manufacturer has to be looking at it at some point. Whether BMW are obviously is, is another another story, but I'm, there's plenty that are. Obviously, Ferrari have had a re recent announcement mm -hmm. with the LMH. Yeah. Peugeot were doing LMH. Then you already have Porsche and Audi doing LMDH. So it opens up being able to go win Daytona, Petit Le Mans, Sebring, and then you can win Le Mans, you can win Spa, you can win all these mega races at a cost that is still exponentially high, but it's not the, the same as when you have all the hybrid era LMP1 cars. So definitely right. much more viable. 
Um, one thing I'd like to go completely off the wall with and just chat to you about is the potential of a race at, say, Kyle Army or a South African circuit in Formula One. What do you think to, to the potential of that? Do you think it could happen? Do you, would you like it to happen? I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, for sure. That would be great to, to have F1 back in, in your home country. Uh, you guys are lucky enough with that, uh, with Silverstone. I've actually never seen Formula One cars live racing, so no uh, that's really? yeah, yeah. Never seen, never seen F1 cars live. So that'd definitely be something cool to have in in Kailami. And as we spoke earlier, it's a mega track. I think the facilities and stuff at Kailami are definitely enough to host an event like that. Completely. Um, yeah. So mm. I really hope that obviously it's it's got a lot to do with uh, money again, as everything in racing. Um, whether they have the funds to kind of really um, facilitate the event, uh, which I think they do. Um, so yeah, we are mega to have um, the F1 back in South Africa and uh, just just for me to see the, the cars and what they're like, for sure. <laughs> I, think, I think we've all seen that on board, haven't we, of Senna in like 1990 or whatever yeah. it was, um, in the old Kyle Army sort of going through the dip or whatever. I don't know what it's called in the British, but that sort of S chicane, fast chicane. Um, yeah, yeah. We- even that looks cool. And it's a mega circuit. It's a mega circuit. Yeah. And if it does go back there, then we'll have to get a petition going for SVDL to do free practice <laughs> one with someone. We? We'll have to get, get all the fans in and, and yeah. make sure he gets in that seat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool, exactly. man. Okay, well, brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks, we can man. we can wrap yeah, it up there. We could chat all day, as with most of the guests we had on, but we'll have to save that for another time. Um, so thanks to all the guests and listening uh, guests and listeners um for coming and you know viewing it all thanks to sheldon for coming on make sure you follow sheldon on social media which is his twitter instagram facebook is at sheldon van der linde and make sure you come back here you know next week for a brand new episode of the hym podcast um yeah again like and subscribe any questions you want to ask any future guests when you know they're coming on uh, slide in the dms get in the comments um i'm sure we'll all be yeah willing to to put those to them and thanks they, again um, for coming on sheldon yeah, make, sure, make sure you leave a rating as well. That's the most important bit. Rating, I'm <laughs> yeah. told by executive producer Alex. Book as well, as well I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, boys. Also from my side, thanks for the invite again. Uh, always cool chatting to you guys, hearing some different aspects of of different championships and so on. And uh, yeah, keep keep doing what you guys are doing, and uh, hope to be back soon for like a follow up or something. Would be cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, for we've sure, got for sure. Yeah, we've got some video content coming up as well, mate. So we're going to get the old uh, YouTube on the go and do behind the scenes. So obviously uh, we'll be racing together a little bit this year or in in the same paddocks at least at some point. So I'll have to get you you on. Yeah, cool. Sounds good, boys. Cool, man. Have a good one. Cheers. Cheers. Ciao, ciao.